talk to you today. This is going to be experimental. I know we just heard a big thing about how we need computational, but I'm hoping that this will be exciting, uh, some exciting ideas for kind of future directions um, for people. And I think there's some real need for computation in this one, so hopefully um, you'll be able to help me out. But we're going to start with a movie. Uh, so this is the movie. So yell out when you know what movie this is. <laughs> Okay, you've seen this before. You can hold your, you already know. Uh, Terminator, which one? Two. Two? Yes. Okay, so this is the one uh, where uh, a robot that is also a puddle of goo comes from the future to try to kill John Connor and uh, because he's going to take down the robots in the future. And um, so what I, what I really like about this, uh, I, these ideas, is that there's a lot of bi like bio-inspired stuff in this thing, right? OK, so what's the bio-inspired stuff? It has the ability to self-assemble. It has the ability to self-organize. Those are kind of your basic things. It's obviously biomimetic, but it is a material. It's a synthetic material. That's really cool. Um, it's autonomous, right? Has it, it actually it produces work, which is the thing I'm interested in. It also can record memory and do all kinds of stuff, right? That, Biology can do, and I know that it can do that because you're sitting there and you're not a puddle of goo, but you are a machine that's a bio machine. And I think that this is this is a very I don't want to create robots from the future. So just FYI to begin with, that's not what I'm ex excited about. But what I'm excited about is all of the places, and I think sci-fi can be a place where we your imagination gets less loose. So I'm really excited about what can we learn from biological systems. And so, um, okay, before we get started, I'm going to do a demonstration, okay? So I'm going to throw these balloons out at you, and you are going to be, uh, you're going to just bounce them around, okay? And keep, the, have you ever played the game Keep It Up? Okay, you're going to play the game Keep It Up with all of these balloons. Ready? Here we go. Are they all out? Nope. Okay. Okay, maybe did not, some did not go up. Okay. All right, so now we're doing, this is a demonstration. Hey, keep a look at these balloons, okay? All right, so I know not all of you are that well coordinated because you're sitting at computers a lot. Um, but, <laughs> all right, so, okay, so what, the, the, what's the point of this demonstration? So now I'm gonna ask you some thought questions. Uh, would you call this process stochastic? Why? What, what about is stochastic? Yeah, the direction, right? And it, like, even when it's in the air, it, maybe it catches some kind of who knows what it's doing, right? It's got a weird shape. So sometimes it kind of the, the currents take it some weird space and all this stuff. Now, let me ask you another question. Is this process, oh, hello, computer, forward, in equilibrium? No. How do you know? You're, you're, you're doing this. I think you ate a bagel or a fruit earlier, and, it, and that's where you got your energy from. So instead, it's active. It's a non-equilibrium process. But if I took a recorder from above, and I recorded the, the just x and y versus time of each balloon, right, or just pick one of the balloons, and I just recorded it, would it look diffusive? Like, would it scale with time linearly? It probably would because of that stochastic nature, right? Even though it's an active process. So, some, so the bread and butter of physics is measuring R as a function of time and then trying to figure out the physical principle behind it. But that can be deceiving when you have an active bath, right? So we, you often have to assume a model, right? And so the problem is, is that your model that you assume isn't always correct. All right, and so what I'm really interested in, what's really cool about an active bath over a thermal bath is that you can get work from it. So if I had a box of air, right, in order to get work from that box, I have to smush it down and put it under pressure, and then I'd get, I'd get work out, right? So this is what you learn about in sophomore physics about the mechanical equivalence of heat, right? So you can do work, and then you can change the temperature, and you can, right, or you could start with a bath at two different temperatures, and you can make an engine, and you can get work out. Now, what I'm going to suggest is that biology is very good at creating uh, these active processes and using that to get work out. And in fact, it's created Maxwell's demons. So back when you were in sophomore level physics, your teacher was like, ha ha, there's this thing, the Maxwell's demon, and it's not real. Yes, it is. It is real. 
It's in all of your cells right now. It's controlling the ion concentration inside versus outside of your cells, your ribosomes, all kinds of things. Okay, that just ion channels alone are obvious Maxwell's demons. They are literally doing this, right? But there's all kinds of other Maxwell's demons. And I would claim that most of enzymes are Maxwell's demons. And so biology ha is this inherently non-equilibrium process. So we, people have been starting to look at these active baths. So I'm showing you two examples of um, objects that can create active baths. One is a bunch of bacteria that are swimming around. And another one are these synthetic particles. They're called Janus particles. And they're able to um, use chemical energy to propel themselves. And each of these can be used um, as active particles that will allow you to rectify the noisy system to get work from noise. So there is no reason that you cannot get work from noise, because noise could be colored. It doesn't have to be perfectly Gaussy and distributed. It doesn't have to be thermal noise. You can have athermal noise, and you can rectify it. And now you can get these, that swarm of bacteria to push a bunch of you know, rotors around, right? And we all know that this happens because I've seen windmills when I drove right out east in California from LA, there's a whole bunch of windmills out there, right? So we already know you can get work from a noisy system. Okay, so <clears throat> biology does this all over. I'm showing you the touch me not plant, which is a, is a ion channel cascade. I'm showing you um, wound healing, I'm showing you mitosis. In all of these cases, there's a hierarchical creation of um, activity that is non-equilibrium at its base, and it gets rectified, whether it's being rectified by cytoskeletal filaments, notice that they're longer than they are wide, very great for rectification, right? Or uh, just uh, you know, ion channel down a tube, which is made by a, by a plant. You can rectify these active processes. All right, so back to the synthetic part, the active colloids. So this is, these are some of the examples of Janus particles. I mentioned them earlier. You, these are synthetic particles that you can coat with a chemical species on one half, and then they will propel themselves around. Now, you can actually coat these with enzymes. Okay, so now you can put a biological uh, chemical fuel source on them, and you can get those to tool around. So now the question remains, can a single enzyme do the same thing? It's performing the chemical reaction, right? Will you be able to get um, kind of, if you make an active bath out of these enzymes, will you be able to get the same thing out? Or and in a sense, are they themselves an active particle, right? Now there's some problems with the, with the scales here. Because the thing with this big ass particle, sorry, am I allowed to curse? I just did. Said ass. I'm sorry. Okay, so with the big particle is that it, it can't rotate very quickly. So as it's being propelled by all the enzymes, it mostly goes in one direction and then very slowly uh, rearranges its orientation. Um, so basically, its diffusion is much slower than its propulsion. So you get a little kind of guy with an onboard motor. This is the kind of hallmark of active matter particles, right? The problem with the enzyme is that it's like th four orders of magnitude smaller. And so its rotational diffusion is really fast. So it's going to reorient itself um, very quickly. And its diffusion is going to be much higher than whatever propulsion it, it's able to do. That being said, there's biological evidence that enzymes are doing this inside of cells. So there was a couple of papers that came out a few years ago. I'm showing you a picture from one from Christine Jacobs Wagner's lab at Yale, where basically she shut off all enzymes inside of a bacterium, and she found that everything that was above a certain cutoff size became glassy, like jammed. It couldn't move anymore. If it was the size of a single GFP, it could still diffuse through. But if it was larger than about that length scale, it would become jammed. And so this implies that the enzymes inside are actively mixing. Um, and so just for physicists, so when I say enzyme, I mean a protein that can catalyze a chemical reaction. The chemicals that it starts with are the substrate. I might use that word. Um, also try to just use the word fuel, because that's basically what it is. And then it's going to make a product or exhaust, right? And that's the chemical reaction that it uses. We're gonna, today I'm going to tell you a story about urease, which is an enzyme that um, takes urea and turns it into carbon dioxide and ammonia. And this is work that was done by my graduate student, Meng Zi Xu. She's awesome. All right, so there's some evidence for this. Uh, previously, so with both catalase and urease, which are both highly... Um, which are very fast kinetically and also highly exothermic enzymes, 
people have shown that the diffusion coefficient can increase over time of the single enzymes. The problem was is that the method that they were using was fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. So what happens in this method, you use a diffraction limited spot, and again, apologies in advance for anyone who loves this method, but every method has problems. You can point out my method's problems later. Um, and I, fair, fair enough. Uh, you do use a diffraction limited spot, you wait for a fluorescently labeled enzyme to go through. As it goes through, it fluctuates in intensity. That intensity fluctuation, you perform an autocorrelation on it. Then you must apply a model, as you typically do with these things. And that model says, I think this is thermal, I think this is diffusion, and that correlation time that you get, I'm going to point at that screen, the, the correlation time that you get is um, proportional to the reorientation time, so therefore you get the diffusion coefficient, right? So the amount of time that this fluctuation occurs, the, the, the decay time of that. Now here's the problem, it's fluorescence. And we know that fluorescence is not consistent, especially when you're in an aqueous environment. So you get fluctuations that might not be due entirely to the decorrelation due to diffusion. And so there was a recent paper that came out a year ago that basically said, look, you can get a lot of changes in this correlation without it. And so I'm a physicist, I'm trained in the single molecule tradition of biophysics, and I wanted to look at it. I wanted to see it with my eyeballs. So we decided to do single particle tracking. The way that we did this is we used urease enzymes, also fluorescently labeled because they're kind of the easiest kind of quintessential enzymes to use. We're going to use total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. We're only able to see the enzymes when they're within about 200 nanometers of the surface. We block the surface with a block copolymer, and we're going to watch this thing as it diffuses. And my goal with this experiment was to show that it didn't work, because that should always be your goal. OK, so my goal was to try to make it fail. It's a lot harder to publish it, but it should be done. Right? We should do this with more than one type of experiment. So prior to me trying to do this, people had only ever really used FCS. OK, so here's what you see. So this is one of our first experiments. We're using a green labeled enzyme. Uh, later, you're going to see some with a red labeled enzyme. It's a little bit better signal to noise. But we can actually track it um, using the single particle tracking. And we can get R as a function of time, just like you would need. From R as a function of time, you can now compute the mean squared displacement. And you can see that it increases linear with time, so it's diffusive. That's what you would expect. And the slope uh, depends on the diffusion coefficient. That's how you back it out. Now, here's the data. What do you see? These two movies I'm playing, one has one millimolar urea. That's the left side. The other one has zero urea. They are moving at the same time. Which one's faster? With urea. You can see it with your eyeball. In fact, you couldn't see it with your eyeball, because the first time Mengzi took the data, she ran in and said the enzymes disappeared. I said, what do you mean the enzymes disappeared? It turned out she wasn't taking the data fast enough to see it. So we had to pump up the laser power, decrease the exposure time, and then she was able to see them. They physically move faster. You can see it with your eyeball. This is, I, 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 you don't seem impressed. I'm like very impressed with this. <laughs> this enzyme is literally moving faster just because it's turning over its substrate. It has fuel and it moves faster. This is surprising. Think about thermodynamics. How does this work? Think about Einstein. Einstein says diffusion depends on temperature, size, and viscosity. Three things. Right? What could possibly be changing in this? We tried to figure it out. So this is just a reminder that if you do the mean squared displacements, you do see the faster one has a higher slope. <clears throat> if you, what I love about single molecule imaging is that you get distributions. So instead of just having one number, I'm now comparing a full distribution of all the different molecules and the diffusion coefficients of those molecules. And you can see a significant shift in the distribution which tells you that the diffusion coefficient has increased. We can do this, uh, we can compare this to inert, molecule, excuse me, inert particles such as catalase and GFP, and we can see that it does scale by size, although if you look at the diffusion coefficient on the right-hand side, you'll see that it's two orders of magnitude slower than you would expect for something diffusing in free solution. We had to purposely slow it down in order to make the measurement, but everything is slowed down proportional to the way you would expect, scaling with uh, its size as you would expect. 
We also wanted to make sure that urea wasn't some magic Harry Potter thing that we just threw in there and it makes everything speed up. Uh, so we did GFP with buffer and GFP with urea and you can see that there's no difference between the urea and the buffer. Now we can look and see how does it change when we change the substrate. This is classic enzymology, right? So now we've got an enzyme, it's got its fuel source, we dial up, we rheostat on the fuel source and we figure out how it, how it changes. It does depend on the fuel source. So if you, you have zero and one, that's what I was showing you before, but now you can see that it actually has a hyperbolic dependence, which is what you expect from most enzyme kinetics. Uh, there's been a, because this is like these ideas have been out a while, there are some, um, but they were all done with FCS, as I told you, all the experiments. There's been a, several uh, experimental or papers that were all done the same way, but the theory papers have been trying to address what could possibly be doing this, because again, three things that it could change. So one of the ideas was that, well, maybe you have some collective effects, because a single enzyme should not really be able to change the temperature or the viscosity that much locally. So instead, maybe it's because you have more than one and they're kind of, we're acting together in a kind of to change either the temperature or the viscosity of the whole system. And so what we did in our original, um, in our original experiments that I showed you before were very low concentration, 92 picomolar, 90 picomolar. What we've done now is added in some unlabeled enzymes to see if it is really a collective effect. If it's a collective effect, we'd expect with more enzymes, we'd have a, a, a higher increase in the diffusion. When we do this experiment, we see no effect, whether we have 40 nanomolar enzyme or just 92 picomolar enzyme. So showing that whatever we're measuring, it really seems to be an intrinsic activity of the enzyme itself. <clears throat> Finally, we presented this at the APS March meeting and some very uh, you know, dutiful theorists came up and said, well, all of these enzymes are multimers. So you need to really check and make sure that you don't have an enzyme that's like kind of falling apart and that every time it does its activity, maybe it's kind of getting smaller and that's why you're seeing it diffuse faster. And so we checked that. Another nice thing with the single molecule imaging, we can get a distribution of the number of monomers that's in each oligomer. Um, it's expected for urease to have six, um, although that's from crystal structure and it's possible that really it's three. We see two to three, and it does not seem to depend on if there is urea present or not. So it really does seem like this kind of dynamic coming apart and, and together isn't happening. The other thing that's a little surprising is that a lot of ours are dimers. So they're not, they're not all trimers. In fact, they're not mostly trimers. They're mostly dimers for us. All right, so this is the end of my research part, but I wanna have a little bit more discussion. I think I have a little time. So what I've shown you is that single enzymes can diffuse faster in the presence of their fuel. The diffusion rate does depend on the amount of fuel present, as you would expect for enzyme kinetics. This is independent of the concentration. I'm sure if we go much, much higher in enzyme concentration, we'll start to get, I mean, this is an exothermic enzyme, so we should be heating everything up. But it, the concentrations that we're looking at, which are kind of, 40 nanomolars of biological concentration, there's no effect. And the oligomerization state is not affected if it turns over its fuel. All right, so what does this mean for physics? It means that we do not understand non-equilibrium physics at all because this does not make sense, right? So again, all of the models that have been out so far have been dashed by the very next experiment. This is the, one of the most exciting places in physics I've ever worked because because I actually get to have that exchange with the theorists where I get to kind of, they say something, I say something back. They say something, I say something back. The goal obviously is to figure out how it's actually working. Um, I'm also very excited about the idea of using these enzymes as active matter. Can you design shuttles using these enzymes on their surfaces? Um, we're actually going this way, we're using DNA origami. The promise of DNA origami is coming true, I think which means because I can now design a nanoscale to mesoscale to microscale active particle, and I can tell it where I want the enzymes anywhere on this particle. So I'm excited about being able to do that. And then finally, questions of the rules of life. Are active baths the heart of metabolism that shake things up inside the cell in order for things to move from one state to another? There's a new kind of big excitement on liquid-liquid phase transitions in cells, right? They keep, they keep using the temperature knob. Guess what? Cells don't do that. Cells don't have a temperature knob inside them. They have an activity knob. 
This needs to be applied to liquid-liquid phase transitions because it's very possible that these are the things that are controlling that phase transition. Okay, so last but not least, if you are a modeler, please bring me your theories to slay. I am looking for a healthy exchange between experiment and theory, and I will assume you are wrong. That's how it is. Okay. And finally, just some other things going on in my lab, self-organization of microtubules, microtubule severing enzymes, transport dynamics. Please go to my website to see it. And of course, thank you to you and everybody else who did the work. Questions? <laughs> it's never been necessary before. Um, can you, uh, yeah, I know. Um, can you change the driving force for the reaction? So, I mean, we, 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 I think you can if you could, that's a good question. So in what way? I mean, we can change the chemical reaction. Are you saying, could you change like how much? Well, so every time the enzyme turns over, a certain amount of energy gets, a certain amount of free energy gets dissipated. Right. But that depends on the solution conditions and how yeah. much, you know, back, you could back the thing up by putting more product in the yes. environment or something. It's not clear whether the enzyme, I mean, eventually the enzyme has to know about that. But. Right. Yeah, so that's what we're trying to do. And Mungzi has actually done like basically a whole PRE follow-up uh, study on this that is, she's trying to push out right now, where we've changed some different environmental factors to try to understand that. Um, and, and so, I, yeah, I think we're, we're trying to address it. We're only one lab, so if anybody else wants to work on this, I'd be super excited. <laughs> um, yep. Um, if there's a reaction occurring, then um, there is uh, a mechanical reaction as the products are um, entering and leaving the reaction zone. Yeah. And uh, is that not sufficient to explain the increase of the uh, diffusion rate? Yeah, I think the problem is, is that, um, again, we think diffusion depends on the size, the temperature, and the viscosity. And it's not, it doesn't make sense as to why that doesn't just get dissipated immediately from the, the thermal fluctuations that should be there. And mm -hmm. so if you do back of the envelope calculations, the fastest rate is like should be 10 to the, like it, the, the slowest rate that heat, for instance, is dissipated should be like 10 to the fifth. And so, and in the chambers that we're using, again, we have very low concentrations and the whole thing is just open to the environment. It's sitting at room temperature. Um, so our, again, our back of the envelope calculations, maybe they're wrong, our assumptions may be incorrect, but that's the thing I don't know and that's the thing we need, I'd like to test. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, should you think of these enzymes as micro swimmers rather than uh, Brownian particles? Because when they do their cycle, they might uh, follow some sort of shape cycle that just let them propel themselves. And that right. would be active diffusion, basically. Yes, yeah, so, there, so there are theories around that basically say, look, the enzymes are oligomers and they do change shape because that's what enzymes do. And they're like, you know, they're the chlamydomonas and they're doing kind of this thing, and it's allowing them to kind of move in one direction. They still, they're still small, so they'll still reorient. There's one very nice study from Steve Granick, and he uses FCS, but he uses a stead beam around it. And what he sees is, he doesn't look at the correlation, which I really like. He only looks at the time of flight through his stead beam. And what he sees is that as he decreases the size of the spot, the time of flight distribution splits. And there's one that's very fast and there's one that's very slow. And he says the fast one are the active ones and they're literally active particles zooming through. And the size he needs to get down to is 50 nanometers. Using his numbers and his sizes, that means that these molecules are moving at a millimeter a second when they're in their active phase. That seems crazy to me. <laughs> so it seems like you should be able to dilute your substrate mm -hmm. so that the molecules are mostly doing normal diffusion and then when the catalytic event happens, the boost is, could be seen discreetly. Right. C can you do that? Yeah, so I think you should be able to get there, but my problem is that I don't think I have the resolution to see a single boost. Right, and so that's why I like that stead experiment because maybe you, you might be able to do that if you can decrease your kind of the inner area of that. Um, my problem is that in order to get enough photons to do single molecule resolution, I need to image for you know a thirtieth of a second, and by that point, I've already done thousands of turnovers when I'm at saturation. And if I if it's just a single boost, I, I think it's gonna be even harder to see. So I think we're kind of, I'm, I'm personally at a resolution limit. So I think that this really does need new technical, uh, kind of uh, different new technical ways to see this, like aimed at it methods. 
That's the word I was looking for. Okay, so I think we're going to move to the next speaker. We can continue discussion afterwards. It's very provocative. Let's thank Dr. Ross again.